Yeah, you may be wondering about this. All things will be made clear in good time. Now, we've just passed Easter. And if you've been in the church long enough, you know that usually after Easter or after Christmas, we see a drop off in attendance. And I think this is in part because we forget what really matters, and why it matters. If someone were to ask you what you believe, what would you say? If someone asked why you believe, would you know what to tell them? Barna did a study in 2011 on religious changes since 1991. That's basically a 20-year gap. They did this research over 20 years And they found that in their uh, survey of self-identified Christians, that means people who identify themselves as a follower of Jesus, also born-again Christians, uh, not really sure what the difference is there, but apparently there's a distinction. Uh, And then we also see a, um, a smattering of how these statistics differ in the Midwest where we are. In, in each of these four categories, attendance, volunteer uh, service, Sunday school, and Bible reading, we saw a drop-off in the number of people who were actively engaged in these sorts of things. With the exception of, we see in the Midwest, those who read their Bibles outside of normal church services, that actually grew a little bit in the Midwest. So go us. (laughs) And then we see that in the unchurched, these are the people that label themselves as Christians, and yet for six months or greater, they had not been to church. These numbers also grew across the board in each of these areas. Now, if we were to just look at the, at the Midwest, there, there are some other statistics that we find, and this is the number of born-again adults in the Midwest. That number actually grew, so yay, that's good as well. But then we also uh, saw some startling changes that showed where people were. The number of people uh, that believed that Satan was a real person, a real entity, a real being, that number dropped off in favor of Satan being a symbol. The number of people who believed that the Bible was accurate, that number also dropped off. The people that believe that God is an all-knowing, all-powerful, perfect creator, the the one creator that is still ruling his creation, that number has also dropped off. And I think part of that reason is we've forgotten why church, why scripture is important. And so this morning we're starting a series that's going to take us through the faith. And we're going to be examining the essentials focused around this singular idea of one God. And so each message in this series is going to be talking about another aspect of this one God. I want to be prepared. I would hope that you also want to be prepared. How would we answer these questions if people came to us? but I want to give a little help here. This is a journey. It's a process. And so what we're not going to be doing is, it's not my desire that I create little carbon copies of me that that I convey to you, well, I hope you will have these thoughts because these are my thoughts. And I also don't want to be giving you a definitive list of everything that is important in Scripture. I'm one of those wacky people that kind of believes that everything in here 
is important. And so what we are going to be doing is getting a broad overview of the essentials of Christianity. And from there, your unique giftedness is going to take over. See, I believe, because I believe what scripture says, I believe that we are all designed differently for a reason. So some of you may be interested in some element of service or, or defending or studying or sharing your faith. That is purposeful. That is how God has made you, wired you to be. And so as you grow, as we come to understand these essentials, God guides you to grow in his will, in his time, in the way that he has designed you specifically to grow. And it's an exciting thing. Will you take a moment and just pray with me as we pray to that end? God, as we study your word, we pray that you would move us, that you would mold us as you see fit, that we would be transformed by the renewing of our minds in Christ. It's in his name we pray these things. Amen. Now, we just finished a series on Jonah. And in Jonah, we talked about something called tribal gods. Now, basically what this is, is if you go back to the very beginning of Scripture in Genesis, God created Adam and Eve, and from there said, be fruitful and multiply, and oh, they did. They multiplied, and as these people spread out, there were some who followed God, and there were others who did not follow God. And I think what we see in Scripture is very much so the same as what we see in our own lives and in our own culture, don't we? We may be a parent and we love God with everything that is in us. And so we teach our kids. But sometimes, because our children are individuals, they don't choose to follow in our footsteps. And so what we saw developing throughout Scripture is these tribal locations, these regional areas where some people followed God, some people didn't. Some people followed the one true God, and some, uh, they came up more with a God to their liking, a God that would suit them personally. And so that is something that we see in our culture as well. We don't like being hampered in our understandings of God. I like this idea of God. And so what we find oftentimes is that we are people who like to create our own God. Now we are going old school and we're going to do a flannel graph type illustration, just because I think this is fun. So, <clears throat> let's say that this board represents our understanding of God. Now, we know that God is greater than all of our understandings, than anything that we can comprehend. God is greater. If we could define God wholly, then we would be God, but we are not. And so, for the purposes of this uh, little illustration, this is God as he is. And so oftentimes, as we come to God, we say, well, you know, I think God is loving. God is loving. He's gracious. He's forgiving. And it's wonderful. And that's the perspective that we have of God. Oh, but some of us, man, we see the evil and all of the pain around the world, and we're like, nope, God is a judge. He, he is sitting up there, uh, like it says in Evan Almighty, or actually this is Bruce Almighty. He's angry, and he's standing over us with a magnifying glass, just waiting to burn our feelers off. You know, God is a God of judgment. Rah! And so this is our perspective of God. Well, there's another level to our understanding of God, and it, 
it could best be described as his involvement in the world. Now, there are some of us who believe, oh, God's got his fingers into everything. He knows what you're doing. He sees you when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. I don't know why that's funny. Anyway, he sees everything. He knows what's going on with you. And uh, that makes you a little worried because he sees you even when you don't want anybody to see you. And then there's another concept of God where very similar to uh, the illustration of the watchmaker. Well, he created the world and then he got it working, but ever since then, it's kind of been hands off. He removed himself, and he's just kind of like, okay, do whatever you need to do. And that's why we see all of this pain and death and disease, so on and so forth. And so we have these views of God. Now, you may not fit in any one of those categories, and that's okay. But I think all of us, at least at some point in time in our lives, we come to God, our concept of God. And for us, we follow Christ, the living God who became flesh. Okay, but this would apply in any faith background, whether, whether you read the Quran, the Book of Mormon, the Bhagavad Gita, the Upanishads. We have these texts that presume to tell us what God is like. Now, in Christianity, we read the Word of God. And at some point in time in our lives, we sometimes come to these texts in a very feeling way. We, we, we come with our opinions and our feelings firmly in place and so our understanding of God is very much so in line with our feelings. And so maybe as we read scripture, we would say, oh, this is something that I really like. Oh, yeah, this is what God is like for me. This is great. But then we come to something that we're not a fan of. And so, yeah, that's not the God that I serve. I'm not okay with that. And so we make these distinctions between what we read and what we choose to believe. Now, something that's interesting here is that some of you could be sitting out there and saying, well, this is all well and good, but you're standing up there trying to tell me what I need to believe. And so we have this concept <laughs> that... Looks good, doesn't it? That's a handsome cartoon. <laughs> Sometimes we have this idea that if we go to someone, if we go to a particular teacher, we're going to find what we want to hear. Scripture talks about it like this. It says, there will come a time when people wanting to have their ears tickled will run after the kinds of speakers, the kinds of teachers that tell them what they want to hear. And so, Pastor, isn't this pretty much what you're doing? You're trying to tell us what to believe? Far from it. I'm not calling you to focus on me. In this church, and it, as it should be in our faith, we point to the word of God, which is authoritative in all things. And the word of God proclaims a God that is not aloof. He, he doesn't have his hands in everything, wanting to just burn our feelers off if we mess up. He's not a God who is just all judgment, ready to kill us. And he's certainly not far removed from our world and our life experiences. And so in this series, we're going to lean away 
from following teachers, away from following me just because I'm standing up here speaking, and we're going to lean in to the word of God that proclaims Christ and him crucified. Christ, where the fullness of God dwells in bodily form. This is the message of scripture that everything points to. There's a quote by Adip. A.W. Tozier, it says, I do not recall another period when faith was as popular as it is today. If only we believe hard enough, we'll make it somehow, so goes the popular chant. What you believe is not important, only believe. What is overlooked in all this is that faith is good only when it engages truth. When it is made to rest upon falsehood, it can and often does lead to eternal tragedy. For it is not enough that we believe. We must believe the right thing about the right one. We must believe the right thing about the right one. Think about it like this. Let's say, let's say I had this friend. Let's call him Jim. Okay, and so I told you about my friend named Jim, and uh, he's, he's a great guy, and you say, oh yeah, I know Jim. And so you start describing Jim to me. And I'm thinking, wait, no, my friend Jim isn't, isn't blonde. Oh yeah, yeah, he's blonde. And, and so I, I say, wait, no. But my friend Jim, he's a comedian. And you say, yeah, yeah, he is a comedian. He's, he's funny, he's kind of a big guy. Uh, no, no, he's not. He's thin. Well, at some point in time, what I'm going to have to do is say, you know what? We're not talking about the same Jim. There may be similarities, but I'm talking about Jim Carrey. You're talking about Jim Gaffigan. Now, if you'll go with me on this, this is kind of an illustration of when we're talking about God. If we know God intimately, then we should know when others are talking about a God that is different from the God that we know. See, Scripture tells us that God is one. And so that's where we're starting. God is one over all. Christ refers to God as Father. And so that's kind of what we're talking about this morning. God the Father. God over all. And so all of Scripture tells us over and over again this repeated refrain. God says, I alone am God. There is no other. I will not share my glory with another. I am God alone. Alone. We sung about that this morning. Your God alone. And so now we are in Deuteronomy chapter 6. If you want to turn there in your Bibles, or if you want to follow on the screen behind me, I'm going to be reading out of the New International Version, the NIV. And so if you have a different version and you're like, whoa, there are different words. It's the same basic idea, different translations, word it differently for different crowds. Okay, so don't don't be bothered by differences in translation. Chapter 6 of Deuteronomy, starting in verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. When the Lord your God brings you into the land, he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to give you A land with large flourishing cities you did not build. Houses filled with all kinds of good things you did not provide. Wells you did not dig. 
and vineyards and olive groves you did not plant. Then, when you eat and are satisfied, be careful that you do not forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Fear the Lord your God. Serve him only and take your oaths in his name. Do not follow other gods, the gods of the peoples around you. For the Lord your God who is among you is a jealous God and his anger will burn against you and he will destroy you from the face of the land. Now, There are many things that we can pull from this passage, but what I'm going to pull this morning is the threefold call of God to us. The one true God calls us to number one, love completely. Love completely, heart, soul, and strength. Now, the heart in the Hebrew culture, uh, but also later on uh, what we see in the New Testament, the heart is the seat of of the emotions, but also the engagement of the mind, being discerning and being right feeling. The soul is, uh, the, the Hebrew word deals with our being, who we are at our very core, not this flesh, but our very being. The word also conveys breath, Well, remember from Genesis, God took dirt from the ground, formed a man, and breathed life into his nostrils. The soul is the breath of God on loan to us from God. The soul, but also the strength. What we use for our daily action and activity our strength, use all of these things. In Mark 12, Jesus adds the mind mainly because of the, the full meaning of the heart, the seat of the emotions, but also the engagement of the mind. He adds mind, and he says that there is no greater commandment than these. And he quotes verse 5 from this passage. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like it. Love others as yourself. Against these things, there is no law. There is no commandment greater than these. Now, talking about love, we know because Scripture tells us that God is love. How, how can God be love? Well, God is love because God is three in one. That is how scripture describes him, three in one. See, love is not an idea. It's not a perspective. It is an action. And love is not love until it is given. And love is not complete until it is received and reciprocated back to the giver. God in his very nature is love, a giving and receiving and giving back love that he invites us to participate in. The second in this threefold call of God in this passage is to remember. Remember two things. Remember God's commands and remember who and whose we are. Right? This is what he tells us. Remember these commands. Now, I don't know about you. You may have a mind like a steel trap. Somebody tells you something once, boom, got it, locked in. Some people, my wife, she is great with this. Names, oh, she remembers it. Names, faces. Yeah, yeah, I remember. I met you um, uh, when I was seven, I think. And I'm like, oh, If you're like me, you need a little bit of rehearsal. And that's what God is encouraging us to do in this passage. He says, keep coming back to it. That means all of life. In all of life, you're coming back to these things. Impress God's commands on your children. 
Do it when you sit at home, when you're just hanging out as a family or with friends in your home. Man, when, when you walk on the road, that means anytime you're outside the house, whether you've got business that you're attending to, whatever it is, you're talking about the things of God. When you lie down, God's on your mind. When you get up, God's on your mind. Tie them as symbols on your hands and on your foreheads. Now, this may be interesting, and you may be thinking, hey, if you come to the Revelation studies on Wednesday nights. Now, in the book of Revelation, we see that the mark of the beast is on the forehead or on the hand. But the same is true of those who follow God. It is clear on their forehead and on their hand. Now, some people believe that that is like a physical thing, I personally believe because of what Revelation teaches us that it is symbolic of all that we do. Everything in our minds marks us as gods. Everything that comes from our minds and our hearts, it makes clear that we are a follower of Jesus. Everything that we do with our hands, whoa, it's clear in the actions of our hands, in the ways that we move, that we are followers of Jesus. So parents, we are told, we are commanded to impress these things upon our children. And so if you are not passing these things on to your children, then you are living in disobedience to God. We are commanded to do that. Children, do you know that God has no grandchildren? As much as your parents teach you the truth of the word of God, nobody is going to be standing with you on the judgment day when you stand before Christ. So the question is, do you believe? You can't ride your parents' coattails into the kingdom. And so what are you doing, parents, what are you doing, children, to teach your children to love the one true God? And the third of this threefold call of God is faithfulness. Faithfulness in the three areas that are listed here are fearing God reverently, being, being clear on who God is, on his greatness. You're clear in these things. You're faithful in your service to God. And you're faithful in following the one true God. Now, in reading this part of the passage, you may have been very much so like me. Whoa, wait a second. Whoa, be afraid of God? What, be his slave? What, be some little lap dog for God, just following him wherever he goes. Whoa, 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 whoa. Before we start having those thoughts, let's go back. Let's interpret our feelings through the authority of God's word. God's commands are given to us for our good because of his great love for us and the desire that he has that we would also love him in return. And so we must align ourselves with what is true about God, not what is false. Align ourselves with the truth of God's word. Do you remember when you were younger? You, do you remember when you were a young girl? Did you think at that point in time that you would have grown up to become a beautiful woman that, that people would love and cherish and value? Or, or maybe you were a, a, a boy. Who knows, but you were a strapping young man that always turned the eyes of the ladies. Did you know that at some point in time you would have a little lady of your own to care for? Or maybe you were, you were this strapping young man did you think at some point in time that one day you would strap a baby boy of your own on your shoulders? Or, or maybe, maybe you were this rocking high school student, right? 
As you were that rock in high school student, did you ever think that one day you would stand on the rock of your salvation and teach others to do the same? See, we change over time. We learn and grow as we go along. But God does not change. God is without changing. When we look at scripture, we see in Psalm 144.4 that for us human beings, our days are like a shadow and then they're gone. What? If you, if you live really, really old, you might hit 100 years old, but that's like a blip on the world's scale. You may, you may live until 90 or 80, but in the scheme of things, in the scope of history, it's just a shadow and then it's gone. But God tells us in James 1.17 that in God, the Father of lights, there is no shadow due to change. That means that if you're pursuing God, if you are walking in the light as he is in the light, and you're there, you're not going to find yourself at some point in time, oh, God has started going in this direction now. He's going in this direction and not, not where I'm going. So I'm in the wrong place now. No, God doesn't change. And so that's why we can trust his word. And we have to trust his word and get to the place where we align ourselves with this one God over all whose word is faithful to us today as it was yesterday and it will be in the future. And so I challenge all of us to align ourselves with God this morning. And I give you a challenge. If you haven't already memorized the Ten Commandments, I challenge you to do that over the next couple of weeks. Maybe it'll only take you a couple of days, but memorize them and think about how these commands were given for our good. And as you memorize them, you may find, as I do, man, I've broken these already. I've failed. And maybe you haven't thought about that before. And so maybe for you, you need to repent of a God of your own liking, a God that you have fashioned after your own ideas and opinions. And so as we move into a time of invitation and as the worship team comes forward to help us in that, I encourage you to think about where you are right now. Has God laid something on your heart? Maybe you don't know the God that we're talking about. Maybe you don't know that God who is so far beyond us became flesh in Jesus, the Christ, and he lived a perfect, sinless life. And then he died on a cross, not for himself, not for anything that he did, but for our sins, so that we would not have to pay the penalty that our sins deserve, which is death. He died the death we deserve. And so in him, we can become the righteousness of God. Scripture says we are literally clothed with Christ. And so when God sees us, what he sees is Christ. And Christ stands in front of us and he can say, yes, they were guilty of all of these things. Yes, as they move on in life, they will continue to be guilty of various sins. But here's the document that says what I have done for them. I died in their place, and their penalty is paid in full. Paid in full. Maybe you never took that step to trust in Jesus. I encourage you to do that this morning. If the Spirit of God has laid this on your heart, 
come forward. Maybe, maybe you need prayer. There is nothing wrong with needing prayer. It is not something to be ashamed of. It is a wonderful thing. And so if you do need prayer, come forward and do that. You can come even kneel down here. We got it nice and carpeted so it's comfy. But you can kneel down and just meet with God. If you want me to pray for you, then stay standing. And I will come and I will pray for you. You are not alone in this world. Not alone alone in this room, and you are not alone because God is with you. So I encourage you all to stand, and as we sing this song of invitation, do what the Spirit of God is leading you to do.